So I'm Cassie Connor. I'm the director of the Auburn University Plant Diagnostic Lab. And so this year was a very wet year. So we saw the typical wet weather diseases that we always see. Uh, we see a lot of bacterial diseases, a lot of root rots, a lot of foliar fungal problems. So I thought that today I would just um, show some of the more interesting things that we found this year. So the first thing was that we found citrus canker in Alabama. And so citrus canker has been a huge problem in Florida and Louisiana, and it's been found in isolated parts of Texas. And I think we all realized that it was eventually going to come over here because the pathogen wasn't going to stop at the Florida border. But we haven't found it until just this year. <clears throat> so it's caused by a bacterium. It's Xanthomonas exonopotus uh, pathovirus citri. And this pathogen causes defoliation. It can cause premature fruit drop, twig dieback, a general tree decline, um, and then fruit drop. So you get these spots that are like raised and kind of quirky. Um, if you can see it in the second picture here, they're kind of raised and they look like little pustules. And then they're surrounded by very, very bright yellow halos. Um, it's very easy to tell that it's citrus canker. Um, it can be identified visually, although since it's a federally regulated pathogen, it has to come to a lab and be tested to confirm that it's positive. So this pathogen it cause, is um, highly contagious, very easily spread through um, wind-driven rain, such as tropical storms, like the one we're having now, lawnmowers, and even human movement. So we're not really sure if this came up from Florida, um, which would make sense. But the first trees that were found infected were in a landscape and the trees had been purchased about a year prior and planted in the yarn and it had already spread to other citrus trees um, in that direct vicinity. And when they traced it down to where the trees came from, the nursery that they bought the trees from actually had a lot of infected trees also. So they were thinking that it may have come in on the plant material. But since then, I think this was in June, but since then, we've also found it in Mobile County. So it may have come in on plant material or it may have come up from Florida, but it seems to sort of be established right now. So the Department of Ag is going out and doing surveying and they are destroying trees that are infected uh, to try and limit the spread of this disease. And then, <clears throat> we're eventually going to be put under a statewide quarantine for citrus canker, which means that you can't move material out of the state. Uh, the second interesting thing that we saw this year was crazy top downy mildew. And this occurs in corn. Uh, this is a fungus and it's very similar to Phytophthoras and Pythiums. They're water molds and they spread in the soil. So you usually find this in areas that are prone to flooding or low areas in a field, but it causes this excessive tillering and rolling and twisting of the leaves. And the tassels proliferate so much that it resembles just this tight leafy structure. It doesn't really cause a lot of damage so far um, because it is isolated to those wet areas. But if we keep getting incredibly wet years, this can start building up in the soil because uh, it has overwintering structures to help it survive and it could start becoming a problem. We uh, identified bacterial canker and for some reason we seem to have found a lot of this this year. So either I'm getting better at identifying this or else it's spreading around a lot easier. So this is a bacterial disease obviously based on the name. Um, it's caused by Clavibacter. It has a foliar phase, which you can see in this left picture, where you get ne uh, necrosis starting on the outside of the leaves, moving inward. And then it very quickly uh, just wilts the entire plant and it collapses. Um, these are samples that Ed Sakura brought in. And if you cut the base of the plant open, you'll see it rotting in the very center of the base. But I think we probably saw about maybe 10, 15 um, bacterial canker samples this year. It can very quickly wipe out an entire field 
if it's spread around. This very unhappy tomato, um, this is another sample that Ed Sapporo brought in. This thing had um, southern blight on it, which is, you can see these sclerotia here. But then when we cut it open and started doing testing, it tested positive for bacterial canker. It also tested positive for bacterial wilt. We were able to isolate fusarium out of this brown discoloration in the vascular system. And you could even see some galls on the roots from nematodes. This plant had no chance of survival. Um, Phytophthora blight on peppers is not something that we normally see either. I've seen it before, but only a handful of times. And it always seems to occur in North Alabama. But you get a wilted plant, and then you have this very pretty purple lesions on the stems, and it's very distinctive. Um, and then if you look at the base of the plant, it looks like the base of it's just rotting. In fact, I think about half the roots have already rotted off this plant. It's, um, this is one of those soil-borne pathogens also considered a water mold, so it's spread around in the soil and it's going to be a problem when it rains excessively. This is pink limb blight, and you can guess why they call it that. It produces this um, fungal structure on all the limbs, and it's very bright salmon pink. Um, <clears throat> I think that's why they call it corticum seminicolor. Uh, this is on fig, but this does have a fairly wide host range in the tropics and the subtropics. I normally only see it on fig in Alabama, but we tend to see it pretty much every year. We've just seen an excess of it this year. Uh, it, it really concerns homeowners when they see this pink material growing all over their limbs and then everything out from the infected area on just collapses and dies. There's not really a whole lot you can do about this. Um, it's more of a problem when it's wet, but you just have to go in there and cut out all of the damaged tissue. In turf diseases, Rhizoctonia was our biggest problem this year. It was active all season long. Usually it only occurs in the spring and in the fall when the temperatures are kind of cool and the environment's wet but we stayed a little bit cooler this year throughout the season. So we were seeing tons and tons of these samples. Um, in fact, we saw a lot of rhizoctonia diseases in general. I've got a couple more um, after this one, but you just get these round patches um, and you'll have a yellow halo around it. And sometimes the turf will start regrowing in the center of it. So if you get this disease, you need to avoid using fertilizers because they produce succulent uh, roots, which the fungus really likes. And you need to avoid using herbicides because you're not supposed to use herbicides on diseased um, plants. It'll, it'll cause further damage. Um, there are two different pest management books to look for fungicides for this if you're a homeowner or a commercial um, company. And this pathogen is pretty much ubiquitous in the soil. Um, it usually only infects when conditions are favorable or the plant's under stress. Uh, so fungicides alone are not gonna control the disease. If you don't correct the stress factors, then the disease is gonna come right back. And you'll have to continually keep spraying for it. So most of the common stress factors are nutrient deficiencies, um, an in, inadequate pH or nematodes. So if you end up getting this disease, I would suggest that you also have a nutrient analysis done on the soil and a nematode analysis. So like I said, we had a lot of rhizoctonia diseases this year. Um, this was in sweet potatoes. This is down in Jacob's area. Um, so it also causes a damping off and that is when you, you get a pre-emergent damping off where your seeds rot before they come up, or you get a post-emergent damping off where the seedlings become infected after they emerge and then they die off. This happens when you're planting into cool, wet soils. Um, these kinds of conditions inhibit plant growth, but enhance fungal growth. 
So um, plants become more resistant as they age. So anything you can do to get the plants to grow quickly is going to help protect against these damping off diseases. We saw a lot of Rhizoctonia aerial blight this year also. This was in chrysanthemums. This is the initial stage of the disease. Um, you can actually see the mycelium, why they call it aerial blight in the foliage and all that foliage just gets trapped with that mycelium. It kind of like glues it together. Uh, so all the leaves stay attached in some sort of jumbled mess. It almost looks like um, caterpillar webbing. And we decided to keep this plant so that we could keep taking pictures of it as it advanced. And it'll eventually just wipe out the entire top portion of the growth. Um, in a nursery setting or a greenhouse setting, if you start getting this disease, you really have to stay on a very strict fungicide schedule and never reuse potting media and make sure you're sanitizing everything correctly. In the way of hemp diseases, the two main things that we're seeing right now is fusarium bud rot and southern blight. Um, <clears throat> these are pictures here on the left from Jessica Kelton. Uh, this grower had fusarium bud rot last year and he started seeing some uh, dying back of the foliage and the buds. Um, so this is a sample that we got when it came in. You probably can't see it because the picture is so small, but you can see the fungus growing all over this material. Um, it was a bad problem last year, bud rot was. People you know, grow the entire season, you have so much input into this crop. And then at the very end, when it's super wet like this, you just, you get bud rot and you lose a lot. So this is usually associated with caterpillar feeding damage. The caterpillars get in there and feed and they open up wounds, which allows the fusarium to come in and infect. So what I would suggest to people, if you're having this problem and you're going to harvest, you need to harvest these infected buds out separately, keep them away from anything that looks healthy because fusarium can actually cause mycotoxins, which are very harmful to human health. Um, and if you are having the CBD processed, the processor is gonna be testing for mycotoxins and they will reject the entire load if they find them. And then with Southern blight, um, you can see this thick mycelium usually growing at the base of the plant and the sclerotia that look like little mustard seeds growing on top of it. Sometimes the fungus will grow out onto the soil around the plant, but it just girdles the plant, cuts off the water supply, and the plant wilts very quickly. So the last thing I wanted to say is that we have a new insect diagnostician, if any of you didn't know. Her name is Dr. Meredith Schrader. Um, she's out here at the Alpha Building in room 139. Here's her email address, and you can reach her at our lab number, um, she will eventually have a phone set up in her lab. Uh, the samples still come to the diagnostic lab. We'll make sure they get to the right place. And we are very happy to have her here.